Hey, good evening, everyone. Marty Missouri here, September 21, 2022, with a stock market snapshot for you. I'll try to keep it brief, but not sure it'll be super brief because I want to touch base on the Fed meeting. I suggested yesterday that I may want to circle back and do another video for you after the Fed meeting. And my, what a session it turned out to be. So what in front of you is the, uh, is the one minute chart, actually. I wanted to show you how the market responded to first the uh, announcement, 75 basis point rate hike, and not a big change of language, pretty much that, and we're going to do more of it, which was confirmed by the dot plot, where they each anonymously stick a dot on a graph that says this is what we think about going forward, Fed funds rate at different time intervals. And yeah, it wasn't the 100 basis point induced sell-off, which I thought would really induce a sell-off. It was actually 75. But with a forecast for rates higher than what the market had already priced in. So immediately we got to call it a one and three quarter percent decline right off the bat again, folks, this is a one minute chart. And then the market formed a base right there, right? Boom, 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 came down, tried to test it here. And then um, at 1130, right, we just kind of danced around in here, get my drawing tool out. And, uh, and yeah, so, and then Powell began speaking, okay? And so during the course of his press conference, right, he made a statement, then he started answering questions. We had a massive rally there for a while, right? We um, started speaking there. So from there, we came up 2.16% from the bottom on the day, you know, more like two and a quarter, two and a half percent. And then he abruptly ended his speech at about 12.15. Pacific time, you know, you can see what we did from there. Just pretty much Korean lower all the way into the close from the top to the bottom, a 3% decline. What a ripping day for an index that has 505 stocks in it, right? Okay, so I want to just uh, share with you the conversation that was going on between myself and Nick. And by the way, you non-client subscribers, I'll just throw out the name Nick periodically. He happens to be my oldest son, 33 years old, and he works out of a, an office that we opened on the Central Coast in the town of Pismo, California. And, but with all the technology, he might as well be sitting at the desk next to me. He, he runs our trading desk. He is a whiz with options that he and I together design our hedges. He uh, is the genius behind kind of the structure of those and how we do those and so forth. So it's a great, great combination and um, really lucky to have him and of course proud. Yeah, as I said, he's my, happens to be my oldest son. And if you ever hear me, by the way, say the name Ryan, my youngest son also helps out administratively for us as well. And then and of course we have other staff members who don't happen to be family members as well. Anyway, so Nick and I are kind of chatting back and forth as it goes. And my comment at 11.36 a.m., uh, and this is when the market is beginning to rally, right? And I said, those puts are getting dumped. Dealer hedges covering and some other shorts now covering. So folks, one thing that the folks who we pay to give us the real insight into what's going on into the surface in the option space. They said it looked like there were a whole bunch of short-term puts being bought with today in mind. And so hedgers and or just speculators betting on the downside. So the dealers who sell those puts will typically, if not always, short the underlying security that they're selling the puts on because if those puts work out, for the buyers and they go down, the dealers get utterly creamed. So it can be kind of a snowball to the downside. But when it starts going back up against them and those puts, you know, suddenly the stop losses are hit and the people who bought the puts aren't making money, they're losing money. Well, then those hedges that were short, those need to be covered or bought and that can force some fuel to the upside. So again, what I said to him is um, those puts are getting dumped, dealers are hedges, dealer hedges are being covered, yada, yada. 
Um, and then I said, data dependent, he just said, and I was speaking of Powell, market should like that because the data has been weaker, okay? And Nick said, and will slow, quotation marks, but Powell is pounding on 2% though. And he was absolutely right. Powell said over and over again, we're not gonna stop till we hit our 2% target. But then I said, he just said, in terms of reducing rates, somebody asked him the question, what would be the scenario where you actually begin easing and cutting rates? He said, we'll wanna be confident that inflation is moving down toward our 2% target first. So he's saying, not till we get there. Then on the specific question, I'm still reading from our notes, when we're heading there, the market went back to green immediately when he said heading. So we had this rally, we went back into the red on the day. And then, so that would be right up in here, right? When he said, you know, when he implied that it's when inflation's going that direction, boom, you know, he said something else about the 2% target. Then he said, when we're heading there, yada, yada. Um, you know, Nick just commenting, yeah, that makes sense. Very goofy, definitely. And then I said, when they say, quote, heading there, the market absolutely parties because inflation is coming off the boil already. Um, again, he said, we'll remain, we will remain restric restrictive until we're convinced inflation is coming down. It is coming, and I'm saying it is coming down already. That sentiment right there is key to equities going up. Well, that all, you know, seemed to make good, smart sense while this was going on, almost to a T, right? Meaning this just, what I just wrote, Nick and I just talked about, followed the movements in the market to a T. And then when he was done talking, kaboom, people just, you know, gave up the ghost. Now, folks, remember, we're in a bear market. This bear market is not over. Our view is that it's not even done to the downside yet, right? But we do see... In the meantime, bullish counter trend, bear rocket rally setups. But like I've told you more and more lately, particularly at this stage of the bear market as we see it, some of these bullish patterns that I illustrate on the hourly and on the daily charts, those are still going to play out. In fact, I'm going to show you one right now. Um, but in a bear market, just by definition, you know, these, the, the, uh, the rips are sold, right? The dips are bought, but then the rips are sold. And one thing that's interesting on this chart though, is the on balance volumes, these divergences that I talk about a lot, you can do it on just about any indicator, right? So you had, um, you had the market sell off here, right? Then you had, you know, you had decent downside volume, right? Particularly, you know, right in here, big downdraft, bit of an updraft and then boom. And then you had pretty high volume on this rally, right, right in here. So this is the volume when it goes up. This is the volume when it goes down, okay? So at least on these minute charts, as it was trading, you can see that the volume on balance, and you can do it, you can see it with the, by this, was actually better to the upside than it was the downside, right? It's because you have a lower low divergent low in the sense that you have a higher low on the on balance volume. So all that says is that the bulls, man, when they bought, they bought in force, although they're toward the end. That was pretty big, pretty big down move with this move here as well. Then we got that, got a nice pop in here. There's no candle here for after hours, but you can see you got pretty high volume to the upside. People jumped in and bought in the after hours there. So anyway, um, interesting stuff. And, you know, a lot of the commentary I, I'm hearing and and reading and listening to says that, you know, he was every bit as hawkish as he was in Jackson Hole. Um, I, I agree in that. And this, this, I think, makes some sense. This is a Fed that is sounding more deliberate on tightening and trying not to waver. Um, I watched him catch himself. In fact, here's another note I didn't realize I missed. I said to Nick, he said he caught him himself saying, quote, growth is good. Then he stopped himself in his tracks and he, and he said, our single focus is getting inflation at 2%. He is, he is really trying not to do what he has been notorious for doing during these press conferences. And that's rescue the markets by offering up hope. But I believe what they say, frankly, when they say we will begin 
softening or easing or whatever you want to call it, you know, not tightening any longer, going neutral, what have you, when inflation is moving convincingly toward our 2% target. Uh, lots of, you know, macro people, you know, there are some macro people who I res respect are making the case that they will not stop until we get to 2% 2, 2 inflation. I aggressively disagree with that. Um, we may get to 2% inflation. It'll be because we get a deeper recession than we happen to be forecasting right here. And the Fed's going to get all the blame for that. Um, I really don't think that's their aim. He is talking about essentially implying that we need to see higher unemployment. Isn't it fascinating that we're, uh, you know, we're worried about people, we're worried about inflation, and we need to create some lost jobs to get rid of inflation. So, you know, what would you rather do? Pay more for, uh, you know, goods and services or lose your job, right? I mean, we can get into those weeds, but it is just an interesting narrative when you really stop and think about it. I listened to an analyst, you know, kind of make that case earlier today, which kind of got me thinking along those lines. But at the end of the day, I just don't buy the notion that Jerome Powell is willing to be Paul Volcker. And by the way, the setup, the underlying setup is so vastly different today than it was during Volcker's days. Federal debt to GDP of 30%. We've got 124% today. You weren't going to blow anything up with 30% debt to GDP. And just as, as, a, as a country, it wasn't remotely where it is today, counting all the other debt, corporate, consumer, and so forth. Today, it's just it just isn't doable. Forget the idea that they're going to push rates to double digits. It just isn't going to happen. Um, four and a half, four and three quarters percent. That's, you know, that's what they're talking about. And that's got the market freaking out right now. Um, the other thing, and I, I mentioned this here recently, is that we were, we were talking about two very different setups, two very different regimes. When Volcker started raising interest rates, he actually didn't think it was going to work because people like Arthur Burns and William McChesney Martin are, they're kind of painted historically as, as just people who were beholden to the politicians of the day and they, they played politics and they didn't get aggressive. Both of them raised rates like by like 10%. I mean, so the reality of it is they did get ag aggressive to try to stop inflation. It just didn't work, right? And, they, and so in theory, they should have got more aggressive and only Volcker had the guts to do that. But when they were doing that, we were still very embroiled in, I would say, kind of a labor friendlier environment. Um, you know, the, the unions had a lot of power. Um, the, you know, the, the emphasis, the economic uh, attention and so forth was really focused in an area that is that is very inflationary. And, and I think I'll help you understand that when I, when I tell you what happened. Right as Volcker really began tightening the screws on the economy, um, it was Ronald Reagan, it was Margaret Thatcher. I mean, they approached fiscal policy and economics vastly different than what had, had preceded them. They were very producer friendly, you know, supply side economics. They were both passionate globalists, right? do business all over the world, get cheap goods to consumers, you know, take advantage of cheap labor. That'll keep more capital at home that we can invest here at home and grow more advanced industries, create bigger, higher paying jobs and so forth. And what comes with that though, over the next 40 years or what came with that is massive wealth and income inequality. Like we had in the 1920s leading into the great depression, if you will, the, Supply side, global oriented economics, now those are very disinflationary, right? So while Volcker gets all the credit, well, I think we also had this, we'll call it again, a regime change that was just getting underway that was very disinflationary. So he actually was able to accomplish something that he himself didn't think he could. Recessions came with it, of course, but also inflation came way, way down and we've enjoyed decades of very low inflation. In fact, I, I think we could probably argue that Volcker wasn't necessary or he didn't need to be that aggressive given the policies that were really taking off globally. So today, folks, we've, we, that has come full circle. Um, 
we're back to the beginnings of very populist, very protectionist, you know, tariffs and bring it all home. And I'm not, I'm not judging anything, by the way. I understand all that. And uh, very labor friendly. I mean, 250 labor strikes this year, which is 100 more than last year at this time. You know, the rail worker situation, they adverted it, but it involved a 14% pay increase, right? And that's happening in a lot of places. I talked to a young pilot the other day and just got a massive pay increase, right? So these are costs that basically are going to find their way into the economy while the consumer is willing to pay those prices. You get it, right? So if we have a recession and the consumer pulls in and we think we are going to have a recession, not a severe one, but we do think we have one where the consumer will pull in. That'll bring inflation back down, but we don't think we're going to see 2%. We think structurally higher inflation is the norm going forward. And we actually think a weaker dollar over the next several years is the norm, which plays beautifully into how we're allocating our core portfolio. And that's a conversation for another day. So anyhow, um, there's your one minute chart. There's how this all played out. The market at the end of the day said, wow, they're promising rates higher than what the market had already priced in and they clearly want the market to take them seriously and therefore it has right and um you may recall i, I anticipated 3800 would be pretty strong support i really thought folks that we would bounce off of that bear market or not and you can see we uh, bounced off of it came back closed Below that, one thing Nick had said to me is he goes, boy, we get a close below 3,800. That may not be a good thing. And so far in the futures market, he was absolutely right. The futures are trading at about 37.69 right now, but they're off of the low. So we'll see. Okay. So let's jump to our 60 day, 60 minute charts. Again, uh, failed bullish pattern, right? We had our downward sloping wedge. We had here, you know, encouraging bullish divergences. Really need that to, to, to do this, right, for a buy signal to be encouraged by that. Certainly had it on the RSI. And again, I'll say it again, these will be, when you'll see these fail more often than not, not more often than not, but more often than in a bull market, obviously, is in a bear market, right? So here's today's big steep hourly candle but look folks um what do we have although we got a sell signal right at the end so this really needs to curve back up before we get down to this level for this to be a valid bullish divergence but we do have it on the rsi right so yet again lower low higher low on the momentum oscillators that we use so that normally would say you know look for a bounce off of that the fact that we came down with such force and the fact that we came down below that 3800 resistance now technically speaking that's a breakdown right that's a breakthrough resistance so there's going to be some levels maybe it's 3750 maybe it's 3700 um 3660 roughly is is the june low some people think that is where all we need to do is test before we're off to the races our level has been 3500 based on mostly our, our monthly analysis our analysis of the monthly chart and how things are trending and our view that the recession is not going to be anything remotely like 2008. there's those are the things that can change our view a deeper recession um, you know basically deeper recession and we also need to see the market we think discount um, earnings that are worse than expected i keep saying that's what we think is really is the character of the next leg down and you're beginning to see that you're beginning to see earnings warnings we saw it from ford we saw it from uh, fedex we've seen it from mcdonald's ge and so forth so we're getting that so we are getting earnings that are being ratcheted down certainly your earnings expectations um and then what you're also seeing is companies react immediately to facebook we found out today is kind of had been stealthily laying off people now we know they're doing it so companies are cutting and so forth so the fed's got to take all that into account plus the topic of yesterday's video and that is the stress in the credit markets so they're talking tough 
That's what they need to do right now. If they want to lower inflation expectations that they are coming down. The University of Michigan, the latest survey shows that consumers' inflation expectations are coming down. So the Fed's kind of getting what they want, but they're very afraid to come off dovish right here. So I don't think Powell wants to continue to hear himself offer up you know, candy for the bulls. But the Fed is telling me exactly what I believe is going to happen, is that as things get worse and the economy weakens more and we get into that recession we keep talking about, and inflation is moving toward their target, meaning it's moving down, there's gonna be a point, I've said it umpteen times, before 2% where they pivot. And that, you know, among many of the macro experts I follow, that kind of puts me in the minority right here. And I get where they're coming from. I mean, that is what they keep saying is that we're not going to let up till we get to our 2% target. They do say those words in particular, but and when asked specifically, what would make you pivot when inflation is moving convincingly toward our 2% target. So I think they're going to call victory before we ultimately get there. And that is going to be massively bullish when we get there. And the market's going to start anticipating that probably before we get there. Now, I'm going to take today for what it is, what the charts are telling us, what the fundamentals are telling us. And yeah, we are trying to, to read uh, accurately what the Fed is actually telling us and read between the lines, so to speak. And then the daily chart. You may recall yesterday that I said, if you want to try hard enough, implied that you could make a bear flag out of this. I made that a little too too big there. Go right here as you take the length of the flagpole and when you break down you go here to the top of the flag itself and you move the length of the flagpole which eh, probably about right where we are a little bit below where the market stopped today and that would be your price target right in there. Let me make sure we're looking at the right one. Yeah, maybe a little further, huh? Yeah, so um, that, that, you know, gets us, uh, let's say, yeah, you know, right in there, which pretty close, getting close to that June lows in here, right? Um, and right now, sliced right through what I really thought would be more resistance to that, and breaking through that with some momentum. And, um, you know, that's, that's technically significant in and of itself, of course. So in terms of um, what we have here is we're wanting to burn through, just about burning through our divergence here on the, uh, on the RSI. Um, you do definitely, no doubt about it, you do have a bullish falling wedge, but you don't have your bullish divergences here as well. So bullish pattern up here, but we don't give it really any credence unless we get something positive here. So things could turn up tomorrow, coming off the bottom a little bit in the, in the uh, future session. But, you know, whether it's today, right, whether, it, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's over the next week, next month, um, our longer term analysis indeed says that we've got some more work to do to the downside. And we think the next leg uh, will be inspired by weaker than expected corporate earnings. And um, so on our original weekly analysis, 3,500 was staked out. If we're at uh, 3,800 now, our price target is right, we're 8% from it. And um, we'll do a 15 year monthly and just take a look at that original analysis. So recall, it's really all about this MACD sell signal, which just works incredibly well long-term, or at least it has historically. And if we're not in a recession or we're in a mild one, that 50 month moving average seems to be where things stop. And we did this for three decades and it just, just worked beautifully, right? So that is what we're looking at here. Here's where we're, we're right now in the month of September. So again, that's another 8% or so below. And again, it, it depends on the what we think ultimately the state of the economy is and how bad what we believe is an inevitable recession ultimately turns out to be. If we're not convinced that the risk reward makes great sense there, which is what we expect, but if we're not, then we'll continue to hedge 
And, uh, but I do believe we will begin putting some capital work, making some rotation among sectors, even if not before then. It is pretty much following the path that we set forth here. We have a firm sell signal. You know, this is a pattern we identified way back, right, when it happened and uh, months ago and then went back and back tested. And we'll see. It's just something to, uh, to consider from a technical perspective. Ultimately, if fundamentally or from a macro perspective, things develop to a point that have us more concerned than we are at the moment, then, uh, then we'll reassess what we do there and how we hedge and how we protect portfolios and so on. So, folks, plenty for one evening. Thank you, as always, for watching and listening. Much, much more to come in the days, weeks, and months ahead.